So God, we just invite your presence into this evening. God, this is a weighty topic talking about mental health and how we can integrate our faith into the understanding of our mental health. So God, I just pray for um, open hearts and open ears. I pray against any barriers or maybe even uh, past experiences that have maybe been negative as people have navigated the church and mental health. And I just pray, God, for some practical ways that we can uh, just connect with you in deeper ways, whether it's as we're dealing with some of these mental health issues or if we're trying to better understand a loved one that is, or just wherever we are at, God, I just pray that you would tangibly meet each person, whether they're in person or on Zoom, and that you would uh, just be near to them and, and hopefully give them a few practical tools coming out of tonight. So God bless this, bless this time. Amen. Okay, so this is the first time. So I, I want to give you a little bit of background into how, uh, how this talk came about. Uh, so a few months ago, I was talking to Emily and I was like, you know, Emily is the church administrator. And I was like, you know, I'd really like to do a class on mental health, but I'm just not sure. And she's like, oh yeah, that sounds great. And we totally never talked about it again for like four months. Um, and Tyler and I were actually driving up to Wisconsin um, a few weeks ago. And as we were driving, uh, I was talking about how my word for 2021 uh, was bold. And he said, well, what does that mean? Like, what does bold mean to you? And so we were talking through it. And he said, well, what does that mean at church? We we're talking about like different areas of our life. And I said, I think bold would be to teach a class at church on uh, mental health. And I kid you not, as I was talking about this, I then checked my email about five minutes later and Emily had emailed me during that conversation. And she's like, hey, I wanted to touch base with you and circle back about that mental health class. And I was like, oh my goodness. So it just felt like it was the right time. And uh, I'm actually really excited to share uh, kind of what God has put on my heart related to this topic. For those of you who don't know me, because uh, there are a number of faces, um, both online and in person that I don't know, uh, my name is Jill Campo. And my husband and I, Tyler, uh, our family has been attending VCC for a, about 11, a little over 11 years now. So we've been here quite a while uh, and we have had a lot of different kind of areas that we've been involved with, but you, uh, right now we are actually the children's pastors at VCC. So usually on Sundays, um, I'm actually downstairs teaching the kids um, as opposed to teaching adults. So this is kind of fun for me to have a new audience as opposed to, you know, five to eight year olds. Uh, a little bit of background on myself uh, and why this topic is so important to me. Uh, so just in full disclosure, I have actually had anxiety most of my life. Uh, so some of my earliest memories as a kid uh, were, uh, I was actually, when I was in, I think, second or third grade, my best friend's house burnt down. And from from that time on, uh, I remember coming home and thinking my house was going to burn down. Like we would literally turn the corner and I would like have this feeling of dread. And then I would be so glad to see, oh, my house is still there. And, and it never did burn down. Um, and so that was kind of some of my first fears. Uh, but then as I got older, um, they, be, they grew. And so I remember remember not sleeping at night as a child, um, just having so much anxiety over life. And to my parents' credit, uh, they really assisted me. I was very fortunate. Um, they never used necessarily the words anxiety. I don't think they even knew that that's what that was. Um, but my mom, you know, she was like into uh, what do people do now? Like oils and she like started to try, she tried everything for me to help me like go to sleep at night. Um, and then the one thing that really did help was when I was in fifth or sixth grade, um, I actually went to a counselor and, uh, it, 
it was not a traditional counselor. It was actually more for athletics, which is kind of funny because I was not like a star athlete, um, but I was a gymnast. And so they t we drove to St. Louis. We lived two hours away, came to St. Louis once a week, and I would see this counselor. He gave me some amazing tools. Uh, and I'll be honest, they really helped me for a long time. So I made it through high school, made it through college, still having kind of this overarching anxiety. To be honest, if, if somebody knew some of the things I did, I totally would have been diagnosed with OCD as a kid, uh, like definitely would have been diagnosed. Um, but, I, but I functioned at a pretty high level and I'm very thankful for some of those tools. Fast forward to about seven years ago, and my dad almost died. Uh, he had a cardiac arrest and uh, it was really scary. You know, my mom called, pretty cool story. He was out um, for over eight minutes. So Tabby knows eight minutes is a long time, um, but they were able to resuscitate him and he is still here. Uh, but it was a long, like there were, there was a whole week where he was in a coma. We didn't know if he was going to wake up. I'm still trying to, you know, navigate life. And that is when I had my first panic attack. So it was about seven years ago. And uh, I was actually <laughs> teaching a class on psychology at the time. So uh, my profession is actually a psychologist, which is I got into because of my own anxiety, to be quite honest. And so I'm teaching this class. I know I'm ha I've I've taught about panic attacks, like I've told people what they are, but now I'm experiencing one. Uh, and I was very fortunate. That was the only one I had. Um, I was pretty self-aware, I knew what was going on. And then about two years ago, my mom almost died as well. So pretty, a very different situation, but just as traumatic. Um, she was in the hospital for over three months. Uh, and I won't go into all the details, but we had to say goodbye to her about three times. They really didn't think she was gonna make it. And again, functioned pretty high in the crisis, doing pretty well. I had learned some things with my dad and I thought, okay, I've got this. And then about two months after she got home from the hospital, I think my brain and my body decided it was done. And that's when I started having more panic attacks. And so um, from about June of 2019 until last February, um, they progressively got worse um, to where they were every few weeks to where I literally was just living in fight or flight for days on end at, at a certain period of time. Um, and so it kind of got to this point where it was like, God, like, you know, all these years I'm, I'm kind of managing on my own and God just, it was one of those situations where it's like, I have to cling to him because I literally can't manage anything on my own anymore. And I, I, I was in a really, really hard spot. And so all that to say, I'm just giving you a little bit of background on myself to know, uh, or so that, you know, this is something that is very much um, dear to my heart from my experience, um, but it's also, I'm not coming at this as I'm preaching to you. I am learning right alongside of others that are going through journeys. Or if you're trying to learn maybe more for a loved one, like this is something that, uh, it, it, it's, it's something that is kind of a lifelong journey and, and yet we can bring God into this. Uh, I wanted to, one last thing about myself. Um, so, and I meant to share this, but you know, this is my first time doing this. Um, I, I got into psychology as a, as a kid, primarily because of um, what I had dealt with. And then as I transitioned to graduate school, I actually kind of veered away from things like mental illness. I did an internship where I was working with people and I knew this is, this is too much for me. Like I was taking it home. I would come home and cry. And my mom's like, is this the best idea for you? And, and so I ended up kind of veering more into uh, research. And so that's actually what I do now. I am a developmental psychologist. Uh, and so my specialty is in parenting. And, and that is actually why I work with the kids downstairs on Sundays. Um, but this has also been an area of high interest for me. Um, you know, currently I'm actually teaching a class on the psychology of religion and spirituality at a school. I teach online. Um, I've taught abnormal psychology before, which deals with mental illness. So this is within my scope. It's just not, it's more my specialty personally, as opposed to professionally at this point. 
So all that being said, thanks to meet all of you. <laughs> um, so we, what we're gonna do tonight, we're first gonna just kind of go over the broad scope of mental health in our culture. Uh, and then we're gonna overview what anxiety disorders, stress-related disorders and depression look like. Uh, we'll talk about some modern treatments, which I just wanna put a plug in. I think modern treatments are fantastic. So I wanna highlight some of those because this talk is not trying to usurp any of those, but rather come alongside modern uh, treatments. And then lastly, I have a lot of different ways that we can integrate our faith into mental well wellness. Uh, and so that's kind of where we're going. So let me start with uh, the broad scope and I have some pretty staggering stats here. So, uh, this actually, these first stats that talk about how many Americans struggle with anxiety and depression, this was pre-COVID. So these are stats that I actually got out of my psychopathologies textbook that I use. Um, and it said 40 million Americans are struggling with anxiety and 16 million Americans are currently struggling with depression. So those are pretty staggering numbers. And that's actually, I think those stats were from like 2018. So they were before the pandemic hit. Um, a fourth of individuals in America will struggle from anxiety, like actually struggle to the point where they would be diagnosed with an anxiety disorder at some point in their life. Many others struggle with anxiety that maybe uh, is undiagnosable, but to some extent they've experienced it. Depression is actually the leading cause of disability in the US um, beyond physical disabilities. Um, so it can be very debilitating. Uh, and then comorbidity is a fancy word for basically saying when somebody struggles with a mental illness, they may struggle with a few mental illnesses. So we're not just talking, you know, somebody may struggle with panic disorder and generalized anxiety disorder. They may have depression and uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. There's all sorts of things. Oftentimes when we have one, we also have another. So like I was talking about earlier, uh, I could have been diagnosed with like PTS, post-traumatic stress disorder from the trauma I experienced, but also I had underlying generalized anxiety disorder. So that's kind of what we're talking about with comorbidity. And it is just very common that individuals are struggling with more than one right now. There are rising rates among teens. So one in three teenage girls struggle with anxiety in our culture. Um, and this often then bleeds into depression because if you're anxious, uh, especially uh, whenever you're a teenager, that often leads to feelings of isolation, which leads to feelings of uh, anxiety or um, depression. Uh, let's see. And then 50% of teens have actually uh, experienced um, one disorder already in their lifetime of teens. So 50, so that doesn't mean they are currently struggling. That means that at some point, maybe when they were eight or nine, they struggled with some anxiety to the point that it was in their file or they struggled with depression or some that it's a staggering statistic. So the, the other statistic that I found crazy. So a few weeks ago, I was starting to do research and they've already come out with research in 2020. You know, we're in 2021, but this was research that came out like two months ago where they looked at the rates of anxiety and depression between 2019 and 2020. And what they found uh, was that there was actually about 8% of the population had diagnosable anxiety in 2019. By May of 2020, it was up to 30%. So basically what that's saying is anybody who ever struggled with anxiety, if we know one in four, they're probably struggling with it right now if they've ever struggled with it. And then some people that have never struggled with it are suddenly struggling with it. And I can attest just from you know my peer groups and my family and just people that I see that those numbers seem pretty accurate to me. Uh, same with depression. So in 2019, the number was about 6.6% of the American population. It's now at 24%. And that was for May of 2020. So again, these may have gone down slightly in that time between May to February, uh, but just the increase is astronomical. And, and whenever we think about how COVID 
is impacting our lives. Uh, obviously, it's impacting us physically, and we see a burden on the healthcare community, but we're also now seeing huge impacts uh, with, with mental health. And, and I think, unfortunately, we're going to see that's going to continue on uh, as we can, you know, it's, it's not just something that, oh, it goes away. This is something we're going to see continuing. So anybody have any questions on those stats? Like I, I want to be mindful that you might have questions, although I'm not sure. If you have a question over Zoom, you can ch use the chat feature or you can also directly message Tyler Campo. So that's my husband. He's sitting right by me. And if you have any, he can kind of parlay them to me. Okay. Let's see. So what causes mental health disorders then? Uh, and this was a really important thing I wanted to go over because I think people don't always realize it's, it's a myriad of reasons and you really can't pinpoint one thing over another, um, but it's usually just kind of a storm that over time various things happen and, and, and then, you know, mental health issues start to arise. So we obviously have biological social and environmental and then psychological issues at play and they're all kind of bleeding together. So what do I mean by biological? I mean your genetics. So you guys, you might be able to look at your family line and see kind of a history of mental illness. And if you see a history of mental illness, uh, you are probably more likely. It doesn't mean you are, but it does mean that you may be more likely than maybe somebody else who doesn't have that history to struggle with a mental illness. Uh, environmental, we, we obviously people who have gone through traumas, people who have maybe just recently gotten out of a relationship, people who are living for months at a time without much social interaction, which has been a lot of us in COVID, those would be ripe environments um, to start feeling more lonely, depressed, anxious, things like that. Um, and, and then we have psychological as well, how people are perceiving situations. You know, so I might perceive a situation differently than Tyler perceives it or different than somebody else. And so uh, kind of our view on the world and how we think and process might be different than somebody else. So for instance, like tonight, I honestly was super excited for this class. I love teaching, I haven't taught in a long time in person. I usually te I teach classes at a community college, love it not anxious. I was a little excited, but I wasn't anxious. But then there's other things that I'm like crazy anxious about. And, you know, and so some of you might be like, oh my gosh, I would hate to teach a class like this. That would be very anxiety producing for me. Whereas I kind of love it. So we're, but working out is like a huge trigger for me. And some of you are like, what? I love to work out. So everybody's different and processes their processes things different. And that's why all these competing things are working together. So this is kind of a holistic view. Um, it's actually pretty, it's, if we want to get technical, it's based off of what we call Bandura's social cognition theory. Uh, and, and he's looking at how the person, their environment, and their thoughts are all kind of intertwining together to impact uh, not just our mental health, but really any part of our lives. It all shapes our lives. Okay, let's go. Okay, so then lastly, as we're talking about the broad scope, I just had to comment on uh, our current culture and, and what we're living in. Um, we, I, I mean, you guys don't have to raise your hands, but how many of you would say that American society is pretty fast paced? competitive, individualistic, um, it's ripe for mental health problems. Like we've created a culture that is just begging to have uh, mental health problems. Uh, and then whenever you mix in with that, pretty poor um, lifestyle habits, uh, and then the isolation of COVID, you're, you're getting this, you know, we're seeing the, the impact of this. So I wanted to read this quote. This was actually from 2012. So this is not recent. I mean, it's relatively recent, but it says greater competition, inequality, and loneliness are the principal factors of the modern Western social environment. Blame for rising rates of psychopathology, including depression. Put another way, the modern man would likely be much more resilient to the tolls of living if he were physically fit, well-rested, 
free of chronic disease and financial stress, surrounded by close friends and family and felt pride in his meaningful work. And I know as I read that, I'm like, oh yeah, well, you know, if I was maybe more like, I can look at that and kind of, yeah, you know, I have to kind of check there. There are probably some things in here that are quite true about, you know, the situations I put myself in that could be creating some of the anxiety or depression or just in general stress uh, that I might feel from living in modern life. Uh, I just read a quote the other day. It was actually on Instagram, how ironic, um, but it said that we are a sad generation with happy pictures. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. You know, we, we kind of post our highlight reel, um, but internally, most people are actually really struggling. And it's actually a large amount of people are struggling it, and, and yet we don't oh, we, we don't talk about it we don't share what's going on you know how are you doing oh i'm fine uh but we but if we actually got into what people were going through we would find out that a lot more people are actually struggling than what we think okay so what we're going to do now is just go over briefly what anxiety, stress-related disorders, and depression are. For some of you, you're literally going to know more than what is on these slides. You're going to know more than what I'm talking about. For others of you, you might know a lot about one, but maybe not as much about another. So I'm going to kind of gloss over these. The intent of this talk is not really to dive into all of the definitions, but uh, I wanted to make sure we at least went over. Uh, so with anxiety, so what anxiety actually is, uh, it's an anticipatory emotion that produces bodily reactions. So you are anticipating something and your body is reacting to that. So maybe you start breathing a little faster. Maybe your heart starts beating faster. Um, I mean, anybody think my classic example to my students is always you're driving down the highway and suddenly you see lights behind you that are red and blue what does your body do and i know for me i immediately go into fight or flight freaking out oh my goodness i'm getting pulled over right um and so there's and there's more than just your heart racing and, and breathing but that's kind of that feeling of what anxiety might feel like for an individual this fight or flight but it can look different. So what an actual anxiety disorder is, is it's fear or anxiety that starts interfering with your everyday functioning. So it is completely normal to feel anxious whenever you see cop lights flashing behind you. Like that's a normal response. Just last week, uh, I had to pick up uh, my youngest from school and it was during that snowstorm and they had not plowed a single road. And literally I was like driving and I, I was like internally, my heart was racing. And I called Tyler after and I was like, well, it was kind of a good experience because I should have been somewhat anxious in this. It, like this was not a safe situation, particularly because I have terrible tires on my car. And I literally slid through a light as another car's coming. Like that should have caused anxiety in me or like a nervous reaction. But when it's starting to interfere with your daily functioning, that's when we start to take notice, oh, this is going beyond maybe what it should normally feel like. It's nor normal to have some jitters here and there, but it's not as normal whenever you, you know, start not going to places because you are feeling anxious. Um, so there are many different anxiety disorders out there. Generalized anxiety disorder, we often call it GAD, uh, GAD. Uh, that is whenever it's just kind of a general anxiety for all aspects of life. But some people, it's more specific to social anxiety. So maybe if, you know, they would not be as likely to, you know, want to meet new people, speak in front of a crowd, things like that. Uh, panic disorder uh, is whenever people have panic attacks. Usually those come unprompted. Like there's not, sometimes there's not even a trigger or if it's the, if there is a trigger, at least what I've found when I've had them, it was so like, I had to really dive in to figure out what that trigger actually was. I was like, oh, that, like, why did my body react that way? It was just triggered. And then I finally caught up to why, you know, an hour later when I had time to actually think about it. 
uh, specific phobias. So some people are scared of specific, very specific things. Honestly, some phobias can really interfere with daily life and some phobias we don't have to worry about as much because they probably don't inter inter interfere with our daily lives very often. Um, and then lastly, obsessive compulsive disorder. So that is whenever somebody has thoughts that um, continue until they can perform an action that would alleviate some of those thoughts. Um, I won't get into all the details, but like I was saying, I totally had that as a kid. Um, I would not, I had to do everything by touching my left hand last. I remember my best friend being like, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, I don't know, nothing. And I just like shake it off. Um, so that's kind of a, an example, a quick example of what OCD. Uh, Anxiety can be mild, moderate, to severe. Um, so it's, you know, I would say I functioned pretty well with mild or low levels of anxiety most of my life. It wasn't until it got more moderate to severe that it was like, oh, this is really impeding on my functioning. Like I'm, I'm sitting here, you know, free, when you have to call 911 two times in like three weeks because you think you're having a heart attack, that's impeding with your functioning, right? And I'm very thankful they were kind to me. Um, but that is, that is impeding with daily life. Um, and a lot of times with anxiety, and this is the last point before we move into depression, it will, it's immune to reason. So your anxiety is not, like you might think back on it, like, you know, even a few hours later and be like, that makes no sense. Why was I so anxious about that? But in the moment, it's so real and your body is taking over that it is not responding to reason. And so that's why, you know, if somebody is in the middle of an anxiety attack, just to, oh, you need to calm down. That is just not going to work because they're not responding to reason. Their body has taken over at that point. Okay. So let's go into depression then. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry, let's not, let's go into stress related disorders. So these are some, so I wanna be mindful here that there is a difference between stress and stress related disorders, but I actually kinda wanna talk about both tonight because I think a lot of us in COVID particularly and just our fast paced lives are dealing with a lot of stress. And so uh, what stress would be anything that is an internal or external event or situation uh, that places one at a, a physical or psychological demand on a person. So there are constant stressors all around us. If you have kids, just their schedules might be stressful in your life. Or if you have a spouse that can, you know, just that relationship can be stressful at times. If you have a job and maybe there's some things going on in that, that is stress. Um, and, and whenever you put too many stress, you know, we, there's actually different lists out there that you can take and it'll give you all the things going on in your life and you can add them all up and it says, this is how stressed you are. Uh, but when you put many things on top of things, those stressors build up and, and, and that can feel very overwhelming at times. So you have one or two stressors, okay, you can probably function okay. But whenever they start piling up, that's whenever it becomes overwhelming at times. Uh, now, to actually have a stress-related disorder, um, that is often whenever people have experienced some type of trauma. Um, so acute stress disorder would, is actually quite common if you've experienced any traumatic event. It's just for the month following the event that you might have um, maybe some flashbacks, you might uh, have some stress response, like just you know, you, do, you don't even entirely know where it comes from, but you're like, oh, I was just in this very stressful event. And so you kind of know what's going on. If those do not go away though, then that's when it becomes what we call PTSD. So post-traumatic stress disorder. So this when somebody is still having that stress response and still maybe having flashbacks or, um, you know, again, it's those situations where you're having, uh, the heart palpitations, the heavy breathing, and, and you, and the, the event happened a while ago, and yet your body is still reacting to it. Um, uh, let's see, a lot of times there can be intrusive thoughts with this. Um, what's happening in your brain, I won't go into too many details, is your brain, there's a, 
there's something called the amygdala. So most of our memories are actually stored in the hippocampus, but we also have what's called the amygdala. And that is uh, responsible for fear reactions, fight or flight. And, I, and I'm not getting, like, I'm kind of skimming the surface a little bit. It's a little bit more detailed than this, but they actually believe that your memories for fear or traumatic events may be stored, is stored in the amygdala. And so those memories are stored differently than in the hippocampus. And so when those memories are triggered somehow, that's how your body may take over. You might with PTSD have a panic attack or something like that. So, uh, we often think of people having PTSD if they've been in service, like in the military, or maybe individuals who have been abused. Um, shot, like I truly did not recognize that what I had gone through with my parents was PTSD until like I was meeting with a counselor, and she's like, "You do know, like that's trauma." And I was like, "Oh, but I, you know, I, I think of individuals who have like been off in war or people who have been in much more scary life circumstances than I was." And she's like, "No, that was actually trauma." And so, when we think about this, uh, trauma can be it can look different, um, but it still could cause PTSD. Okay, then the last one is depression. Um, so depression is a mood state with symptoms or sadness or despair. Uh, people often feel worthless and they withdraw from others. Um, like I, I think I went over the stats a little earlier, but, but among individuals, about 14 to 20% of Americans will have at least one episode of depression in their life. And that would be um, major depression, not just like you know, you get sad for a few days. That, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a bigger, um, a, this occurring for a little while longer. Actually, as somebody at our church, actually, I, I didn't recommend this book because it's, I tried to only give Christian books um, just because that was the topic of this talk, but somebody at church um, suggested this book for me and I bought it and then I realized how big it was. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to read that in two, the two weeks before this talk. Um, but I did read some of it and I just really liked um, one of the, the quotes. It said that grief is depression in proportion to circumstance. So if you lose a loved one, grief is kind of the sadness that you should experience because that's a really sad event. But depression is grief out of proportion to circumstance. So, you know, everybody, if, if you lose, if your spouse passes away, that is a time to grieve and it is very expected that you would be sad. Or if, you know, a marriage falls apart or you have a miscarriage, you know, whatever, there's all kinds of circumstances that cause us to grieve. But depression is experiencing that grief out of proportion to what's actually going on in your life. So this would be the extreme sadness when you didn't have that major life event occur. Um, let's see, I, uh, some symptoms, just rumination or repeated thoughts, and usually they're very negative. Um, so feelings of worthlessness and then a lot of negative self-talk related to that. Um, oh, and that kind of goes along with self-critical beliefs. Fatigue, just tiredness. Um, we'll talk about the physical symptoms in just a minute, uh, but also reduced motivation. And another thing I liked from this book was that mild depression, it's it, the way it described it. So you can have mild to moderate to severe depression. And if you have, or, and severe is usually called major depression. And if you have major depression, that is a really hard place to be living in. It's, I mean, you're needing a lot of assistance. Whereas mild depression, a lot of individuals will still function, just maybe not at their best during mild depression. Uh, but this is this undermines uh, the way the book described it is mild depression undermines people the way rust weakens iron. So it just is a slow kind of cor corrosion of, you know, it's mild, so it doesn't seem like it's interfering, but slowly you realize that relationships have kind of fallen away. Slowly you realize you've lost interest in your normal activities. And so you kind of, you can look back at maybe, oh, in the last six months, here's how this has corroded on me, but it wasn't, you know, in daily life quite as significant. You weren't noticing it as much. And that's kind of an example of what mild depression looks like. Um, there are other forms of depression. So uh, like I said, there's mild to uh, 
uh, major depression. There's also bipolar disorder, which we're not really going to get into. That would be when people have major depression, but then also episodes of mania. And then lastly, there's seasonal affective disorder, which now is the time uh, that seasonal affective disorder uh, usually occurs in the winter time when there's not as much sunshine. Uh, in fact, I read, I think it was last week was uh, Blue Monday, which is the saddest day of the year. Um, and so a lot of people who may not experience depression all year long are more likely to be sadder this time of year. Okay, so let's go, oops. Sorry, let's go into then uh, physical symptoms of mental health. So this is kind of what, if you've ever experienced any of these or maybe somebody that you're close to has, and now again, these are kind of broad sweeping because I didn't specify them to each disorder, um, but changes in appetite are very common. Some people will eat more, some people will eat less. Um, gastrointestinal problems. People don't realize it, but like acid reflux is actually very common in individuals that are struggling with anxiety disorders. Um, and so people will go in for, and they'll, you know, have all this medicine for acid reflux, but, and again, not everybody with acid reflux has anxiety, but they may want to also check, you know, what's going on mentally as well. Um, sleep disturbances, some people will want to sleep more. Most people, unfortunately, can't sleep as well. So uh, in the height of my anxiety, I literally was not sleeping um, for a few weeks, and that's not uncommon. Uh, and, it, and it will ebb and flow for people. Um, but it's when your brain is on overdrive and you're thinking, it's very hard to sleep. Uh, nausea. So sometimes people, I mean, if you've ever been nervous and kind of felt like you had to throw up and that's a pretty, a lot of people feel like that. Well, sometimes individuals with anxiety or depression or stress related disorders will feel that nausea a lot of the time, like a slight dizziness or nausea feeling. Uh, physical pain, especially with depression, it just feels like everything hurts. Um, Sometimes it can be real pain and sometimes it can be what we call somatosensory, meaning it's like you almost will it into hurting. Um, so it's like if you think about it too much, then suddenly, you know, I think about my arm hurting, suddenly my arm actually does hurt. Uh, and so it's this weird, your brain is capable of doing a lot more than, than we often give it credit for. Um, but sometimes when you are depressed, uh, it really does hurt more because that's just kind of where your body's at. And, and so it is real pain as well. So sometimes it's somatosensory, like it's kind of more in your head. Sometimes it actually is just real physical pain that is more than normal. Uh, and then obviously just increased stress. We all know that when we're nervous, our heart might increase, our heart rate increases, our breathing increases. Um, headaches are another thing that's common. So there are, and there are more than, these are just a few physical symptoms. But if you're looking at this, you're like, oh, I've experienced some of those. You know, you might, oh, like I didn't even, I know before last year when I was having the panic attacks, I didn't put together some of the physical symptoms that maybe were impacting me. I also, <laughs> looked at my family line and could see that some of these things, oh, hmm, maybe actually some of my family members are struggling from, and not that you don't go home and like diagnose all of your family members, um, but I could see, oh, some of these things might actually be more related to mental health than maybe some of it was physical health, or they're just kind of co-related at the same time. Okay. So let's, sorry, I keep going back. I'm not trying to get out of this, but it just keeps happening. Um, again, if anybody has questions, especially over Zoom, because I can't see any of you. Yeah, Ty, yeah. Oh, it's called The Noonday Demon by Andrew Solomon. So, and like I said, just be in for a wild ride here. It's very long. Um, you can see I didn't make it very far. <laughs> I love to read, but it was just too much in the last week. Um, but it was, I would suggest, so I, I have like I, I have not personally struggled with depression and I would be cautious if you are in like major depression at the moment, this probably wouldn't be the book for you. It would be more of a book to help you understand depression or if you were in a better state, but you knew depression may come, you know, if you're more slightly depressed as opposed to major depression, that, that would be my um, caveat there. Yeah. David Stark. Okay, yeah, David. On the three circle slide, how does response to reward play into anxiety? 
Oh, David, that's like really hard. And, and going, um, response to reward play into anxiety. I'm, David, I'm not entirely sure what you're asking. Was that, let me look, just give me a second here. Um, oh, okay. So basically people can interpret situations differently. And so how I might perceive something, like, like I was saying earlier, I was excited to teach this class tonight. And I was a little, like my body was react. I'm honestly hyper aware of my body at this point over the last year. And so I could tell today that I was maybe my heart was racing a little bit at times, but I was able to perceive that and like cognitively say, no, I have this event tonight. And so I know that that's why I'm feeling this way. And so I'm not going to let this turn into anxiety. So I was able to take what my body was saying and then cognitively think about it and then move forward as opposed to I'll just give you an example of when my brain spirals. Um, just last week, I worked out, I'm really trying to work out again and it's a huge trigger for my anxiety. And I know all of you are like, that makes no sense. But whenever you're, my dad died like 20 minutes after work or almost died, didn't die, um, almost died 20 minutes after working out and he was in great physical health. And so it's just kind of this, like in the back of my mind, oh my goodness, you're gonna be like your dad. So I work out only Anthony's home. That's my four-year-old. And I'm like, my heart's racing. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I might die. Like, and nobody would be here. And Anthony's going to see me. And then my brain. So it's like, I had the physical response of my heart was beating, which it should have been. Um, I had just worked out pretty hard, but then my brain took that and spiraled down. And so I perceived it a different way. And it went into more anxiety than today. It, it really didn't. I hope that kind of answers your question. And maybe David, we can talk about that. Um, more and more detail later. Any others, Ty? Okay. So let's then go into traditional treatments. And I really want to emphasize, like, I love these treatments. I think, uh, like, I am a huge advocate of psychology. Um, I am a psychologist. So I, I, I was very hesitant to even do this class because I didn't want people to think like, oh, I'm saying that you shouldn't do all these things because I, I totally think uh, that there's a lot of benefits to traditional treatments. So number one, go find a therapist. If you think that if even if it's just mild anxiety to, you know, all the way to major depression or major like generalized anxiety disorder, a therapist can really help talk through that. There's two primary, we call it like active versus passive therapy. Uh, psychotherapy would be where you're talking more and sharing what's going on. Usually they dive into your past to kind of try and understand where the depression is coming from, where the anxiety, PTSD, any of those symptoms are coming from. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is a little different. That's going to focus more on, okay, we know you're struggling with this. What are some practical ways that we can, you know, help you work through your thought process and your behaviors? So they're going to give you more like goals and tips and tools. Now, a lot of therapists will actually use a combination of both of those. So maybe you'll talk and then they'll give you practical tools as well. My biggest thing here is just find a Christian counselor. And I say, it doesn't mean that a non-Christian counselor can't be helpful, but a Christian counselor is going to come from the same worldview that you have. And having been a psychologist and having, you know, I was fortunate I attended a Christian undergrad and then I went to a school kind of a Christian grad, but not really. Um, and there was a definite difference in the worldview that we were coming from between my undergrad to my graduate education. And, you know, as Christians, there are certain things we believe at the core about who we are, who God, who, who God is, that God made us, but also, you know, understanding uh, our reliance on him that somebody who is a non-Christian counselor may not come from that worldview. And especially humanism is super popular right now. You can be the best at anything. You just need to achieve a higher and higher and higher self. Well, that's actually not aligning with Christian scripture that we, as we grow, we recognize even more our reliance on Christ. And so finding a Christian counselor is, is huge. Um, 
Also, uh, medication is very common. Um, so what medication does is it's going to alter specific amounts of neurotransmitters in your brain. Um, so a lot of them actually, so I'll just give you a quick example. If you've ever seen commercials for, they'll talk about like SSRIs and that stands for selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Uh, what that means is it's increasing the amount of serotonin in what we call the synapses. So there's these neurotransmitters and there's this little bitty space in between them. It's a fluid space. What an SSRI does, if you take a medication like that, um, it's going to increase that. So it can increase the amount of serotonin in your brain. That will help you feel better. So we actually use SSRIs for anxiety, depression, panic disorder, very common medications. Um, other um, medications are going to maybe increase the amount of dopamine, uh, norepinephrine. Um, there, there's different ones. Uh, so, okay, but this is where I want to caveat just a little bit. Um, I, I am not against medication at all, but I think people should also be cautious that they're not just using medication. Um, so for example, about a year and a half ago, the first time I went to the doctor, I had had my first panic attack. Um, I went to the doctor and he just, he literally saw me for two minutes and he's like, okay, here's a prescription. And I was like, well, wait a second. Like I haven't done anything else yet. Like, like, okay. And, and I filled it and, and I, and I actually, I, I didn't take it. Um, and Tyler and I made agreements like, hey, every two months, we're going to evaluate this and see if I should take it. And honestly, there was probably a month or two in there where I should have taken it. Um, but it was kind of one of those, let's, let's tread slowly into this. And the reason is that if you're only doing the medication, it's kind of like having a gaping wound and putting a Band-Aid on it. And the wound is still there. The minute you're not taking it, the wound is still there. So what I, the way I look at medication is that it can get you relief, especially if you're in a really dark place so that you can then start working on processing some of the deeper issues. So again, I'm not against medication, particularly individuals that have bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, even major depression, they, they need medication. Okay. So I'm not against it, but if you are suffering, if you know, from mild anxiety that maybe you've never had pre COVID, like let's dive into some of those deeper things that are going on. And then in a few months, if you think you still need it, then, then go for it, try it. But just doing that and nothing else is actually not going to get to some of the root issues. Okay, that's my, and also research has actually shown if you have mild depression, uh, taking an SSRI is actually no more beneficial than having a placebo. Um, and a placebo is a sugar pill, so it's no pill at all. Um, so it's helpful if you have major depression, but for mild, uh, they actually exercise, sunlight, there are a lot of more traditional kind of um, natural things that we can do that are just as effective. And that actually goes into this next slide. And I am, I'm happy to talk more offline about therapy and medication. I know a bit more about these, but that's not really kind of what we're, our focus. But if you have any more questions, like I'm happy to talk about those offline. Um, some other, yeah, you got a question? A couple questions. Yeah. Would you have had yeah, so my number one would be uh, Crossroads Counseling here in town. Uh, there's, I know a lot of people who go there. They, I, that's where I went. Um, really helpful. Um, uh, St. Louis Counseling Center also has a number of Christian therapists um, on staff. And, and there's more than that, but those are the two. Those are the, be the two that I would. Um, and if you want like a specific name, I, if you could, you could email me personally. Yeah. Yeah, I actually, I'm glad somebody asked that because I had crossroads written down and then I never said it. So any other questions today? Okay, so some additional treatments that aren't really faith-based but can be very helpful, exercise. So I told you that's kind of a trigger for me, but it's so good for you if you are dealing um, with anxiety or depression. It decreases cortisol, which is a stress hormone. Um, it's drudgery for people who are depressed, but yet it has been shown to be very effective for individuals that are depressed and also anxious. So it's not going to be overnight. You're not going to exercise once and like suddenly feel better, but they've shown if you go for like 30 days and we're not talking about like go 
joining CrossFit. We're talking about like taking some walks around your neighborhood. Um, so like, don't think that I'm saying you need to be like in perfect shape, just getting outside, walking, things like that can be really helpful. Uh, breathing exercises can be really helpful, particularly with stress related disorders and anxiety. Um, I know bell, I put this picture here because belly breathing is um, a it's supposed to help your immune system as well. Um, so if you're worried about COVID, that might be a good thing, but also it can really help you de-stress. Um, also some grounding exercises. So I actually just taught the kids in Sunday school, um, you know, thinking about maybe uh, one thing or I'm sorry, like five things that you can see around you, four things that you can hear, three things that you can touch, two things that you can smell. And so the idea is that it's just getting your brain on something else. You're kind of grounding yourself to where you currently are instead of maybe what you're fearful of or what has you anxious in the moment. That would be more for somebody with anxiety than depression, but those exercises can be really helpful. Uh, and then lastly, diet and vitamins. Um, this is actually, I, this is something I kind of got into this past year. Um, so I have actually, I did not realize what a trigger sugar was for me or even artificial sweeteners. So sadly, as much as I love Diet Coke, I have not been drinking Diet Coke for like the last, what, six months um, because I realized that that was an anxiety trigger. It may not be for you. I'm not telling everybody to go off uh, caffeine, uh, but caffeine was kind of a trigger for me. Um, reducing alcohol. Alcohol is actually a major trigger for anxiety. People take it to relieve stress, but then they will find a few hours later, they are actually more nervous or anxious, or even the next morning, they're more anxious. Um, and just a healthy diet in general can be really beneficial. Uh, there's actually a doctor out there. She went to Harvard Medical School. Her name's Uma Nido. I, I don't know how to say it. It's N-A-I-D-O-O. -O. She came out with a book called This Is Your Brain on Food fantastic. Um, just something like there's research. I, I eat blueberries all the time. I actually ate them before, um, but blueberries help with PTSD. And I was like, Oh, I didn't even know. Um, and so she gives all, I actually follow her more on Instagram than I've, you know, read all of her journal articles, but she, she just has practical food ideas, um, that can be really beneficial. Again, is that gonna like, I eat a few blueberries and suddenly I feel amazing? No, that's not how it works. This is like small things that can be beneficial. They're not cure-alls, that's just not gonna happen. Um, also vitamin supplements can be really helpful. Uh, I started, so after I went to my doctor who I actually love, so I'm not downplaying my GP at all. I went and saw him once after that experience. Um, I actually really like him and he was super honest with me. That's what he does in his life. So he's like, Hey, I struggle with anxiety. This is what I take. And so I really appreciated that he was open with me and he shared what he did. And so I don't want to downplay him at all, but I also started seeing, um, somebody that, uh, it's like more of a naturopathic doctor. And, uh, she gave me a bunch of vitamins that I could take. And again, I actually am not taking most of those now. I took them for a season until I felt like my body was a little bit more regulated. I'm super weird. It's probably part of my health anxiety. I don't even like to take vitamins, guys. So um, because they actually make me, I, one day I took a, something and I felt sick all day. And so I called her up, but just little things like vitamin D, magnesium, B12. B12 is supposed to help with depression. Vitamin D can help with pretty much anything in life, um, especially around COVID. Um, magnesium can really help with anxiety. Um, GABA, which is an amino acid they've found can help with anxiety. So there are different things that people can take. Um, but I would talk to a medical person before you just start taking that because I said any of those. Um, Cause that's, that's what I did. I did go see somebody about these things. Cause I didn't feel like I was an expert enough. Um, okay. So any questions before we jump into kind of the meat then for the last, you know, half hour or so. Ty, any questions? Okay. Well, stop me if they do. So, okay. Now we're actually getting to kind of the part that I really wanted to address tonight. And I think it's important to have a groundwork, but this is the meat. Um, and it's how does faith play a role here? And th this is something that I've really wrestled with. And, and I'm realizing that as Christians, there's kind of been this dichotomy, you know, people don't really 
talk about mental health that much. And it's slowly people are starting, you know, I grew up in the church in the nineties and you just did not talk about your mental health at all. Like you might pray for somebody who was physically hurt, um, but if it was mental health, it was, you know, what my church called it an unspoken request, right? Like we didn't actually talk about these things out loud. Um, but over time, younger generations are feeling more comfortable talking about their mental health. Um, but even some of those individuals, you know, I just had a student write to me last week. Uh, it was a paper on faith development, and she wrote about how at her church, she she struggled, and I'm not giving any names away here because she doesn't even live in this state, but she wrote about how how she struggled with anxiety. And when she told her pastor, uh, basically what she felt was communicated was, oh, you're just not praying enough or you don't have faith enough. And so there's some real shame that can come as part of having a mental health journey in the church. And so because of that, we might uh, be fearful to talk about it. And yet I think there's actually so much need to talk about it in the church because we as Christians have have Jesus, which is our hope, as opposed to, you know, individuals having no hope. It would be much harder to live with depression or anxiety when I didn't have a future hope in Jesus than, than what I live with now, with knowing that these present troubles are terrible at times, but yet I know I have an eternity with him. So one of the biggest things, and this is, I, I have this worded here, let's change the script, because that is what God told me to write on that one. So I prayed about this so much. And I was literally every time I was like asking God, what do I talk about? I just kept hearing, change the script, change the script, change the script. And I was like, I don't know. It, like, it doesn't look good. Not that I'm a master PowerPoint presenter or anything like that. But I was like, oh, I don't like that. But that's what I wrote because we have narratives and, and we have scripts in psychology we call like a script is like what you anticipate things look like so i have a script for what it looks like to go to mcdonald's right i'm gonna go through the drive through i'm gonna tell them my order i'm gonna go to the first line pay second line get my food i have a script for that what that's gonna look like we have scripts and narratives for our lives as well and in our current culture they don't usually align with faith or Christianity. So some of the common narratives that we're seeing right now in our culture, I'll just give two, would be celebrity and prosperity. So we have narratives of you need to be seen. How many likes are you getting on your Instagram? How many people are commenting on your Facebook post? Well, that's a celebrity. That's wanting to be seen. Uh, prosperity. I need to be the most successful. I need to make the most money. I need to have the highest position at work. I need to be um, even, you know, at time, like I want more power, right? And, and we might not, you know, uh, if we meet somebody, we probably wouldn't say, oh, that's the narrative I align with. But if you really think deep, you might align with some of these narratives just because you're part of American culture and they just kind of seep in over time. I know I have certainly aligned with some of this. Uh, I actually got off Facebook recently. I didn't actually deactivate my account, but I just haven't checked it in quite a while because if I post a picture, I do go back and look at how many people liked it, right? And then I'm like, why did I do that? That's so stupid. Um, and, and I'm also, I'm not posting a picture where like I have a double chin and my eye looks funny, right? I'm posting pictures that look good. And so we live in this like, celeb we wanna be seen and we wanna be seen a certain way or press, but we wanna be successful. And I would just challenge everybody and I'm preaching to the choir here, consider what narratives you're aligning with. And what we wanna align with is a kingdom narrative. Our, we are aligning with, we want Jesus as Lord, and, and we don't want celebrity to be seen by others. We want to be seen by God, and we want to see God working in our lives. And, and so um, just, I think that's something to, you know, ponder, maybe something to journal about, like, what narratives am I unconsciously maybe aligning with that could be contributing to anxiety or depression or you know what what stress in my life. So for me, uh, 
sometimes it's, you know, I, I tend to put a lot on myself. I, I tend to overcommit uh, or maybe even work a little bit more than I need to. Um, some of you are laughing at home because you know that, um, that, you know, I teach a lot of classes. I try and I'm always trying to engage with my students. I'm trying to be the best mom I can be. I'm trying to be the best wife. I'm trying to be the best children's pastor. And at the end of the day, like, I'm trying to perform. I'm, I'm under this narrative of performance. And then I wonder why I'm stressed and, and somewhat anxious about it all. And it's like, well, maybe it's the narrative that I'm not allowing Jesus to come in. And uh, just this past summer, there was something with children's ministry that was kind of stressing me out. And uh, it was actually Annie said something at a meeting. Stephen's wife said something at a meeting. I just felt like God lifted that burden off of me. And it was a change in narrative. It was a change in kind of the script of, hey, Jesus has this and he knows and he's going to care for these kids or these people. What I don't want to go into the issue I was dealing with, but he knows more than you do. And so you need to align with him. And so I just challenge you guys to um, really think through what those narratives are that might not be aligning uh, with, with scripture. Okay. Uh, the, and then that kind of leads into uh, this idea of our identity being in Christ. Um, so I, I really want to bring home the fact because I have felt this so many times, particularly as a kid. And then I found my oldest starting to align with their identity being um, in mental health. And so our identity is in Christ it's not in our mental health. It's not, your identity is not that you are an anxious person. Your identity is not that you are depressed. Uh, your identity is not that you are, you know, what, whatever it, you know, that you're the most popular person at church. No, no. your identity is in Christ. Okay. Um, so first Peter two, nine says you are a chosen people, a Royal priesthood, a holy nation. God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And, you know, I, I tell my kids all the time that they are children of God. If you have accepted Christ as your savior, you are a child of God. So you are not an anxious, like you are not to be identified by maybe the struggles that you have, but rather we are identified as his children. Um, and going along with that identity is that our that identity being a child of God actually shapes how we then think and how we behave. And so I, I have this quote by Rich Mullins. I'm a huge Rich Mullins fan. He's like a singer songwriter from the 90s. So that's dating me. Um, but he has this song called Creed. And it's actually how I learned uh, the Nicene Creed as a kid. I had no idea that it was the Nicene Creed. I just knew the song and then I, you know, I got to college and I had to memorize it. I was like, oh, I already know this. Um, but in kind of the bridge part of the song, it says, I believe what I believe is what makes me what I am. I did not make it. No, it is making me. It is the truth of God and not the invention of any man. And we are so quick in our culture to want to make for ourselves what we want to be. You know, I want to be a celebrity. I want to be rich. I want to be, you know, the best at whatever X, Y, and Z are. And what really we're not making, our identity is already formed as Christians, as a child of God. And we're not making it into anything else. Like that is our core identity. And so, and that is making me. That is making our thought patterns, that's making our attitudes toward things. And so that that's really a foundational, that's something I really had to dive into in the last year is, you know, I believe this in my head, but I was not living it out. I was living as an anxious person and I was identifying, you know, how are you doing? Oh, I'm really anxious, you know? And, and that's fine for a season to acknowledge where you're at, but I was living under this lie of my identity was in the mental illness, not in my identity in Christ. And so it's something uh, that I still have to remind myself of, but it's something that's a really good reminder. Okay. Um, Okay, and that kind of goes into some of these other things like 
with your identity, you can still feel depressed, anxious, afraid, sad, and still be able to recognize truths about God. So, and, and this is actually, if you, and, and I wouldn't, for some of us, if you're in the pit, this will, this will actually still be really hard. Okay. It's very hard. If you are suffering from major depression and you're in the throes of it, like at that moment, it's really hard to feel a connection and just be totally honest. If you're in the throat, I know there was a few weeks in there when I was at the height of anxiety, it was really hard to form that connection. But if you are, you know, a little bit removed from that, maybe on the back end, or maybe you're in a season where you are functioning better, these are truths that you need to really tell yourself that even when I'm afraid, God is still in control. And even whenever I feel like the world is crumbling around me, God is still good because he's outside of like, he, he is, all these things are still things that are true. Even if I don't feel them in that moment, he is still trustworthy. That, that for me has been the hardest at the, at the end of the day, when I had to dive into my anxiety, I realized I wasn't truly trusting God in a lot of areas of my life. I trusted him in some but I wasn't trusting him in, in all areas. And so, and that may not, you know, you, there might be other parts of aspects or attributes of God that you kind of realize as you work through this, oh, I wasn't fully, uh, you know, I, I maybe knew that in my head, but I was not experiencing that in my heart. Um, and then secondly, anxiety and depression do not disqualify us from being people of faith at all. Uh, you know, a lot of times people feel like, oh, well, I, because I suffer with this, somehow I can't, you know, then be used. That is a lie from the enemy, like just a straight up lie. Um, I want to give you a few examples from the Bible. Uh, Elijah, he was a prophet. Um, he was so beaten down at one point by being a prophet that he actually asked God to take his life. Okay, so that's, uh, that's somebody who's at a low point. In the Psalms, David certainly is asking many times, God, why is my soul so downcast? Well, that sounds a lot like depression to me. Um, you know, uh, Moses, he was anxious about leading the people. He actually said, no, God, not me. I am not qualified to do this. I don't want to do this. And yet, you know, he, he, he led the people um, out of Egypt. Um, even within our contemporary culture, one of the people, one of the books I recommend at the end is on uh, Charles Spurgeon, and he was, um, he's a famous um, Christian writer and uh, theologian, and he suffered for years with depression. And, uh, and so there are people of faith, both from the Bible and then today, uh, that greatly struggle with mental health, and yet God is still using them. And actually done see look how this powerpoint just connects itself our struggles can lead us to christ and and this is um something that we need to recognize that the more we grow in our faith the more we recognize our reliance on christ and as much as we hate to say it sometimes when we have that anxiety or depression we recognize like we have to surrender. Like I can't function anymore, God, without you because I'm literally not functioning on my own. And so it creates this, like in, in a certain way, any struggle can lead us to Christ. But I would, I would encourage you to try and think of some of these mental health struggles as things that are making us more and more reliant on Christ. Um, so this verse, I actually heard this verse uh, my freshman year of college, and it kind of became one of my life. Where, you know how we all have things that we kind of we just gravitate toward. And uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. And Paul is writing there and those words are just so powerful because we recognize that through our weakness, Christ can be magnified and Christ can be made known. And, uh, you know, our weakness can actually be our strength, even when, because whenever we are weak, then we are actually strong in Christ. Um, and, and I would actually even say that through our weaknesses, 
we actually can serve people better through that. So we want to be, you know, we want to focus and serve others. And, you know, when, when I talk to somebody else who has had anxiety, like they, like their wisdom in that actually helps me that bolsters my faith. And then maybe one day I can bolster their faith. And, you know, that cycle can continue. Um, I was uh, thinking about Henry Nowen is a, um, a, a Christian writer who passed away a while ago, but he had a book called The Wounded Healer. And it talks about how, uh, you know, our wounds and those things that are hard in our life actually are some of the things that then make us be better uh, servants to others. And they help us connect better with others because we're, we're the people who get it. The people who have been there before and the really hard pits of life, they're the people who get it whenever somebody else is going through something. And they're not just going to give the pat answer of, oh, you should have just, why aren't you just praying more? Or, oh, you know, you just need to go to this group for two weeks and suddenly you'll be fine. Those, that doesn't work. And those people will recognize that and they'll be, they're more likely to be in it with you on that journey. Um, so I've always liked the idea of a wounded healer because certainly if you're helping others and you're a Christian, that's likely what you are because we are all wounded in certain ways. Uh, so th things to ask yourself, what am I learning about myself through my depression, anxiety, and or stress? Like what is God trying to teach me? Uh, how is God drawing me to himself in this time? You know, about a year ago, David and I were talking one day and uh, I was telling him, I was like, you know, as much as I hate going through this anxiety, it's making me realize how much more I need to be trusting Jesus. And I was like, so as much as I wish I had never gone through these panic attacks, Part of like, I'm not thankful right now, I said, but I'm actually going to be thankful for this down the road. And, and looking back on that, it's about a year later, I, I am thankful because it helped me be more reliant on him. Doesn't mean I necessarily want to go through it again, um, but that's kind of how any struggle is. Any, okay, if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask or you can type. Um, wanted to give some more practical exercises. Uh, so one of them would be practice gratitude. Um, this is one uh, that Ann Camp wrote a book a number of years ago called A Thousand Gifts. Uh, Anne herself struggled with pretty intense uh, anxiety. She had agoraphobia. She's very open about this. If you've ever, she's a very prominent Christian writer right now. And uh, she, it was just kind of a dare from a friend. She said, hey, I know you're really anxious. Like just try and write out like a hundred things you're thankful for. And in that process, um, she ended up writing like over a thousand things she was thankful for over months. Like this was not something that happened in a day. Uh, and then she wrote this book about it, but she, she got this from Philippians four, six through seven, which says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. And that little phrase with Thanksgiving was what stood out to her. And she's like, I had totally missed that before. I'd never even saw, like I had memorized that verse, but I had never thought about with Thanksgiving. And that's kind of what gratitude is our Thanksgiving. So tell God the things that you're thankful for. I have read, and I don't, I'm actually questioning if this is true, but I have read that when you are in gratitude, you can't be anxious at the same time. I'm not sure that's true because I feel like my brain can be gra have gratitude and literally two seconds later be anxious. But I will say that when I have a heart of gratitude, I am thinking about things that aren't causing me to be anxious. And when I have a heart of thankfulness, um, that is a much better mental place for me to be in than for me to be worried. Because when I'm grateful, I'm actually thinking about others and I'm thinking about what God has done for me. And when I'm anxious, it's usually more about where I'm currently at as opposed to all these things that are um, around me. Okay. Uh, let, what's that? What was that first? Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Yeah. Um, 
Then secondly, meditate on God's word. So I'm not going to just, I know it says prayer in the Bible here um, for these two. And I don't want to give the pet answer of, oh, you should just be in your Bible more. And why aren't you praying more? Because it's not as simple as that. Um, but being, let scripture encourage you. So I have the handouts. If you are on Zoom, I emailed them to you. If you're here, uh, you have them. But take a few of these that stand out to you and meditate on them. Or whenever you are feeling depressed, pull those, just read over them. Let them seep into your heart. It's not going to happen once. You're going to need to do this again and again and again and again. So one of the ones for me, it's a verse I learned when I was a little kid, is just trust in the Lord with all your heart. Because my anxiety stems a lot from, I'm worried about having this heart attack, right? And so I, I just remember it hitting me one day, like a year ago, like, I'm not trusting God. And this verse says, trust in the Lord with all of my heart, not just some of my heart. And so do I do that perfectly? Absolutely not. But can I rely on that verse to keep telling myself, okay, Jill, this is what you need to do. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on my own understanding, which is my brain that's going a hundred miles a minute, probably down some brain spiral that's in no good place, right? But instead let's focus on things above. Um, so be encouraged by scripture. And, and so, like, is it beneficial to just read through all these? No, I would read through them and pick like one or two and maybe put it on your mirror for in the morning. And, you know, that's what I often do is I write them down. And I put them somewhere where I can see them and then I can remember them. Um, or just, you know, another one that I love for anxiety is cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Like God cares for me so much that he wants me to cast all of these worries onto him. You know, and it could be things that you're anxious about. It could just be stressors in life. But he says he wants to, he cares about me. Um, it's actually in the Bible. It says in the Bible 365 times, fear not. And I don't think that's because, like, I, I think that's because God knew this would be a struggle for humans. Like God knew humans fear. And so I want to help them know that they don't need to fear because they have me. And, and so I, I don't, I mean, there's a reason it's in there so many times. It's because he knew it would be applicable to our lives, whether we're living, you know, a thousand years ago or living in 2021. Um, okay. With meditating on God's word, I also wanted to comment, think about what your other inputs are. Okay. So if you are consuming more news and more social media than you are consuming the word of God, then there's probably an imbalance there. And, and I'll be the first to admit, sometimes I am doing that. And then I find that I'm stressed, right? And so when, I, when I'm when i not as consumed by what, and that doesn't mean you can't care about what's going on in the world. It doesn't mean that you can't check, you know, how your cousin's doing in South Carolina. Like, it doesn't mean those things. But if I'm not daily inputting scripture or God's word into my heart, then it's not a surprise that my brain would be elsewhere and that my mind would be on all, we are literally living in crazy chaotic times. And I mean, I could, I probably would have told you that two years ago and I'm, it's even magnified right now with everything going on. And so what are your inputs? Ask yourself, what are your inputs? How much relative, you know, outside influences versus God's word. Um, and, and that, I know that is a huge challenge for me. Uh, thirdly, engage in prayer. Um, so one, uh, I mean, that's trite. We, you know, prayer is great. One practical way I think that can really help with anxiety or depression is just doing what we call imaginative prayer, where you think about situations and, and, and this is not, I don't want you to dive into like trauma with that, but just think of situations in your life and, and imagine that Jesus is there with you in those situations. So, you know, this was a, you know, I'm sitting in a hospital room waiting for my mom to wake up. And, and I realized like in praying about like, oh, Jesus was actually there with me. And he was, he was like comforting me. And he was sad too, that my mom was so sick. And, or, you know, whenever you're going through that really painful separation or whatever that situation is, like recognize that Jesus was there with you in that. And, and that can be, uh, a, a comfort and, and something that can be really powerful in prayer. Um, 
Okay, and then I have some more here. Um, play and adventure in God's creation. We don't play enough and play can really help with depression and anxiety. You know, when's the last time we, we, we see kids play, right? But even kids aren't playing as much as they should. Um, but when's the last time you went on a walk out in the woods and just had fun with it, right? Or when's the last time you, um, I don't see, I can't even think of things for play, but like played whatever you like, you know, played tennis or um, played frisbee or for me, it's actually, uh, I love to take walks in the woods. So that is a way that I play, but we've been playing more board games at home. And as long as nobody gets too competitive, Tyler, um, usually it's really fun, right? And so we like, that's really enjoyable to me. Um, I was actually just reading an article the other day. It was talking about uh, reading children's books. It was talking about how helpful that can be for people with anxiety. And I was like, oh, that's so true. We've been reading through the Chronicles of Narnia with the boys and I'm totally enjoying it more than they are. In fact, half the time, like one of them falls asleep before I'm done. And, uh, but I'm like into it. I'm like, oh, this is so beautifully written and I love it. And it's like, I'm off in another world and that's a stress reliever for me. And so, you know, what, maybe it's reading poetry. Maybe it's, you know, just the other day I was playing the piano for like an hour at home. Uh, and it was just such a stress reliever. So play and then recognizing that God, like that's a gift from God. So it, it is a form of worship in that you are real, you are enjoying the creation that is around you. Okay, uh, practice Sabbath. So this is um, this is something we don't do in our culture. We do not have a day of rest. And uh, whether it's, you know, a lot of research has been done recently on tech Sabbath. So people not being on their phones for one day a week, it's hugely helpful for your mental health. Um, I would encourage you to try it. Uh, I've actually been doing this for a long time where I do not work from Friday night to Saturday night. Uh, that does not mean I've never replied to an email or something like that from a student. Uh, but what it does mean is that I try really hard not to be engaged for that period. Um, and I, I would like to actually go further into where I don't even, you know, check my phone and things. I'm not there yet. Um, but Sabbath can be really helpful. It helps us realize that our worth is not in what we produce. So our worth is not in how much we are getting done. It is in, again, that identity is in being God's child. And, uh, and so that can be really powerful to practice Sabbath. Uh, let's see, journaling. Oh, worship. Uh, just listening to worship music. I had to add this one in because it's actually not one of the ways that I de-stress, but it is for so many people. In fact, for my kids, um, every day Luca gets home and it's the cutest thing. He's 11. He's like, Alexa, play Corey Asbury, Reckless Love. And I'm always like, okay because it's like this eight minute I and mean, it's so long and I'd so and he just like loves it and I'm like okay I love that you're connecting with God in this way and so I have to recognize that you know some of these may work for you better than they work for me but I think they can all be really powerful but that is one that's really been helpful um for him uh and I know I think for most of us um just listening to worship can be it can set our mind on things above instead of maybe what our current circumstances are journaling getting your thoughts out is huge if your mind is racing put them on paper and it is actually more likely that they will dissipate a little bit more in your head uh, just try it Okay. Journaling is like a lost art. People don't really do it anymore. It can be very helpful for individuals with anxiety and depression. Uh, and, and at least for me, when I journal, I, I, I'm like praying to God in that journal. So, I mean, it's not necessarily a faith-based strategy, but yet you can make it faith-based whenever you're talking to God about it. Um, yeah, it's, it's good to embrace our emotions, but not let our emotions be a master over us. And I think that's one of the things that journaling has helped me do is I'm embracing my emotion. I'm acknowledging that I'm anxious or I'm acknowledging that I feel this way. I feel sad or I feel lonely, right? But yet by putting it out on paper, it kind of allows me to put it there. And then I'm not then allowing it to master over me. I'm, allow I'm allowing God to hopefully seep in with his word on, on, in my life, as opposed to letting those thoughts rule over me and those feelings.
uh, embracing community. Uh, so, and I would say Christian community. Uh, and, and again, I don't want to be weird about social media, but we just don't see a ton of benefit. Research continues to come out that is just not beneficial. Um, can there be benefits? Yes. Like, I love that I can see, you know, my cousin just got engaged and it's like, oh, I probably wouldn't have well, actually my mom texted me, but um, you know, I might not have known that if I hadn't have seen it on Instagram. Uh, but in general, it, we're seeing people's highlight reels. We're not really seeing what's going on in their everyday life. It leads us to be more judgmental. It leads us to question our own livelihood, like what we're doing. It's, it's just a thief of comparison. And, uh, and, and so it's, while it can be helpful at times, it's not overly helpful, embrace real community. I know that's hard right now with COVID. Um, you know, you're not maybe going out and seeing your friends as much, but, you know, tech, have a text chain with some people or maybe meet over Zoom or if you feel comfortable, meet face to face. Having a few people can really be beneficial for your mental health and just relationally. Um, and if you don't have that, pray, like, pray about that earnestly. I literally prayed for like two years for friends um, a number of years ago. We uh, kind of whenever we started coming to this church uh, and God generously answered my prayer, um, but it did not happen immediately. Friendships rarely happen immediately where your best friends, it happened gradually. Um, but it was something that literally I had to, I, I prayed for almost every day because I just really wanted strong friendships. Um, and I knew enough from friendships I had had in college that it was possible, but I didn't live near any of them. So I didn't have that in my everyday life. And, and so just embracing real community. Uh, and then lastly, just reciting prayers or creeds. Um, I think there's a lot of beauty and traditions from the past. I started uh, reciting a prayer I actually used to recite this prayer from Thomas Aquinas um, before I would go into my philosophy class in college. And uh, my professor had us do it. And I remember thinking it was the stupidest thing. I like, why are we doing this? this I came from like a non-denominational background where we never, that would have been like honestly thought of as like super taboo. And uh, my professor had us do it. And I still say that prayer every time my kids go to school and have a test. I'm like, okay, let's say our prayer. And I recite it and they look at me because it has big words. And I'm like, guys, one day you'll appreciate that I say this prayer. Um, but it kind of got me on this journey of uh, reciting other prayers or creeds and just prayers of individuals that they've prayed that have helped them in hard times. Like sometimes they might be write more eloquently than you or I could. And so using some of their prayers to speak to God can really be powerful. Um, and if you're interested in that, I actually have like a whole list um, of some prayers uh, that you might want to use, but I, I didn't print them out for you. Um, okay. So I also have here, this is I wanted to be done right around eight and we are. Um, I have uh, just some helpful resources. So I actually emailed everyone who was on the list tonight. Um, these are helpful resources that are from a Christian perspective. So there are actually a ton of resources out there. If, Like I was saying, this Noonday Demon, great book on depression, but these are specifically real, from Christian authors um, that are wrestling with where faith and uh, mental health kind of collide. And uh, so I have either read them personally or um, for the depression ones, actually a good friend of mine recommended them that uh, she's a licensed counselor and she uses them in her practice a lot. Um, and so they might be good ones to read. Actually, uh, Spurgeon Sorrows um, by Zach Eswine. He's actually a pastor here in St. Louis. Um, so that was, I put him on there. Um, it, it's actually one of the reasons I started talking about my mental health more was um, Tyler and I, before we came to Vineyard years ago, when we had first moved here, uh, we went to a church in Webster and the pastor struggled with anxiety himself and he would talk about it. And he then moved on. He went to um, another church. He's now a pastor at a huge church in Nashville. He writes tons of books, but I still remember how personal some of those sermons were about his anxiety struggles and it made me realize like oh 
like God is using you in amazing ways and you struggle with this. And so like, I know that God can use me and, and, you know, even though I struggle with this. And so actually Zach Eswine then took over that church um, after he left and he himself uh, struggles um, with depression. So anyway, kind of interesting, um, kind of a local connection. Uh, and then I don't know if you can see the last one, but the stress and busyness, that's not, if you struggle with like PTSD, the ruthless elimination of hurry would probably not be the best book, but more if you just have a lot of stress in your life, it talks a lot about ways that you can de-stress your life and kind of focus on, um, on things that are most important, like our faith. So, okay. Whew. So, I am going to pray and then I'm going to stay on for questions if we have them here or online. And then for those of you in person, we also um, can have a time for prayer if you would like it, but it's also eight o'clock and I want to be mindful of that. So you can also uh, get going. So let's pray really quick um, and then we'll kind of close out. So God, we just uh, thank you so much for an opportunity uh, to just think more about mental health in general, but also how faith relates to our mental health, God. We thank you, God, that you made us as people with brains and minds and thoughts and emotions. And God, I, we just ask that you would help us even in the midst of hard things like depression or anxiety or panic, that God, you can, you can use those things for our good. And you can take our struggles and, and just use them for things that grow us into deeper relationship with you. I pray specifically that you be with each person here tonight, whether it's them learning more for a family member or more personal to them, that they gathered something from you, God, and that they act on it in the coming days or weeks or months. God, we ask that people who are in a really hard spot, that they get immediate help, whether that's in counseling or medication. And we ask for others that, um, God, you just continue to draw them nearer to yourself. You are a good God. And we thank you for who you are. Amen. Okay, so on that note, if you guys, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, if not, log off. Or um, here, if you're here, you guys can stay in chat, we can pray, or you're welcome to go. So, uh, there, and it's totally up to you, so. Thank you so much, Jill. Yeah.